Praise the Lord. King's Cross. What's good? I'm amazed at what I'm seeing. It's wonderful in my sight. Known Pastor Clint for many years. Known Pastor Hez for several years. I've known Minister Jonathan Solomon. I don't know what your official title is. (laughs) For a few years. And the rest of the elders here, we have this mutual bond because we're united in this purpose. And um, so I pray you'll receive me as your distant brother, um, a a family member who came in for the reunion. He's being allowed to go to the mic. Uh, Oh yeah, my brother, Shaw. Oh my goodness, love this dude. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the height, because I was always the short one, but I just love to hug him. It's something about the angle. It's a perfect angle to hug him, and his arms are nice and, like, huggable. Praise God for your heart being big, big, big. Um, We miss Clint, don't we? Pastor's home, as he should be, doing what he needs to do. That brother blesses my heart. I know Pastor Clint in one vein, longing to see the mystery of Christ proclaimed. That is polar opposites coming together to be fellow partakers of the promise, to be unified in their diversity under the Lordship of Jesus Christ on display for the onlooking community to to see. And so he's committed to the church, in particular, a church that when you look out, you see what we're seeing uh, a portion of today. So I just want to let you know that uh, I am taking this all in. Uh, Let me pray, ask for the Lord's help, and then dive in. Uh, Gracious God and Father, we come before you. Um, We've prayed, and we've prayed again, and now we're praying again. Would you help? Would you help me? Help me not mess up what's been going on. Prevent me from being a stumbling block to someone. Use me to, in the same vein as that what's already happened, to move out the way and allow the glory of the Lord to rise among us. <laughs> would you shine? And would someone who's disinterested in spiritual things perk up and say, what is this, a heart to listen? Would someone here who's not that into Jesus say, what is this? A desire to know the God of salvation? And if there's anyone in here that has an aversion to church but find themselves among us, would they say, what is this? A interest in being together with others who seem to be into this God of salvation? (laughs) Would you do that, Lord? And make sure that I don't do anything to impede that. In Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, you might remember, Geico Insurance had a set of commercials, ads that came out, sort of titled, It's What You Do. They would basically give you a scenario, and they would basically say, It's what you do. And if you want to save 15% or more on insurance, you get Geico. It's just what you do. There was a man who was in quicksand looking at a cat, asking him to go get help. Here, boy. Here, boy. Get help. And the cat looked at him, and they said, when you're a cat, you ignore people. It's just what you do. (laughs) They had another one where there were some screaming teens in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a dark place. And they said, when you're in a horror movie, you make bad decisions. It's what you do. They said, why don't we get in the running car? They said, what are you, crazy? Let's go hide behind the chainsaws. <laughs> or a woman who's microwaving her burrito, waiting for it. And then they say, 
if you're the band Europe, you love a final countdown. <laughs> it's just what you do. Well, you know, we had a whole weekend talking about a great salvation. I mean, King's Cross and sponsorship enabled us to have two full days of just taking in what the Bible would describe as so great a salvation that we've been regenerated, made alive, even though we were dead because of our rebellion against God and our falling short of his mark trespasses and sins we've been justified meaning that God declared us righteous even though we were all guilty <laughs> we've been adopted God made us his children even though because of sin we were rebellious creation we were sanctified and we're being sanctified meaning we're becoming like who God says we are and that we were glorified and we're being glorified and one day we will be glorified and we will be just as he is. So great a salvation. <laughs> now if you have so great a salvation, <laughs> what is it that you should do? <laughs> when you have a great salvation, you share it everywhere and share it with everyone. It's just what you do. Presbyterian minister and missiologist Robert Speer one time said a person has to do one of two things with their religion if it's worth its salt. <laughs> they must either give it up or they must give it away. If your religion, if your salvation is so great, you must either give it up <laughs> or you must give it away. Well, the good news is this morning that we get to talk about a salvation that is now on the move as we don't give it up, but we give it away. Acts chapter 4, 1 to 12 is all about the gospel on the move. Salvation on the move based on chapter 1 of Acts 1, 8. It's going from Jerusalem to Greensboro as though it were. It's going from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Acts is about salvation on the move through people who refuse to give it up but who are determined to give it away and so acts really gives us the scenario where we see constant episodes of people being put in positions where they would either give it up but instead they keep giving it away Acts is about a sovereign God, the God of salvation, on a global mission using an unstoppable gospel empowered by an all-powerful spirit to have a people from every inch of the inhabitable globe. And so the question is, can we? I know it's what we do, but can we do it? And so this morning, we're mindful of the fact that we need encouragement to know not only must we do it, but that we can do it. Simone Biles, the most decorated gymnast, recently went to Tokyo uh, ready to compete in the Olympic Games. And she is the most decorated gymnast. And she was expected to win, 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 win. Forget everything else. Win, 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 win. Only one? Okay. Y'all don't know that one. Amen. Amen. Okay. All these faces, I figured somebody knew that one. But... Never mind. <laughs> she didn't even, under the weight of being required to go and do what she was expected to do, she was crushed under the weight, started talking about mental health and the fact that she needed to not only not win necessarily, but not even compete. And people disparaged her. And people derided her. And people humiliated her to which she responded we're not just entertainment we're humans and by saying we're humans what she was admitting is sometimes a human is expected to do things by others that they really are not able to do well this morning I just want to give you good news you're able to do what you must do <laughs> and God is going to show you that that's what the church does it's just what we do we're going to look in this text. We're going to see that we proclaim the word of Christ despite pressure, that we do good works by Christ's power, and that we bear witness to Christ despite culture. 
Let's just look at the text. Because of our great salvation, the great God who gave it to us, we don't have to give it up. We get to give it away. Acts 4, 1 to 4. You've already, we've already read it. Let's just go through. One, we proclaim the word of Christ despite pressures. You could say persecutions. But just for the sake of time, anything that would seek to derail and detour you, you proclaim the word about Christ. Text says, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about five thousand notice we have a little episode where someone tries to hinder the word from going forth and the text is sure to let you know yes it put some in prison but many believe the word and the number swell to about five thousand men the text picks up already in progress with as they were speaking. Chapter four continues something that happened in chapter three. In chapter three, Peter and John, heads of the apostles, they were on their way to the temple doing what Christians do, pray. And when they were going on their way, they began to share Christ like Christians do because a man said, do you have any riches? Do you have any treasure? Do you have alms for the poor? They said, we don't have any cash. We don't have the cash app but such as we have take up your bed and walk they gave him a good deed based on their their role to be carriers of good news oh and so what happens everyone starts getting excited everyone is like man what is this you know it's Jesus who you thought you killed who's still on the move Jesus the God of salvation who came and accomplished salvation who brought salvation is still on the move so chapter 4 says and so they were still speaking now it is the ninth hour of prayer that they started they went to the temple at 3 it's now so late in the evening that they don't put them through the, the, the law process. They just lock them up because it says it was already evening. It's probably around 6 p.m. So from 3, when the miracle popped off and the sermons began, to 6, it says, and they are still speaking. And now some people come up and they have a problem with it. Isn't that what Christians do? They talk about Jesus to others and they do it for an extended period. Sure, we're in a day where people are admitting that our attention spans are smaller. We, we hear and we learn in sound bites, but that's not what a Christian does. <laughs> when you have a so great salvation from a God who's so great, the God of salvation, you talk about Jesus in length. <laughs> it's just what you do. <laughs> This is what we do. We're called Great Commission Christians because he sent us. And part of the Great Commission entails talking about Jesus on and on and on. It's just what we do. Are you still talking about Jesus? Are you still capitalizing on when people ask you for things? Are you capitalizing on the fact that people are coming to your home? Are you still capitalizing on the fact you have a platform? Are you using it to talk about Jesus at length? The, these are here talking about Jesus. And what happens when you talk about Jesus, expect persecution. When you talk about Jesus, you can expect some kind of pushback, opposition, or persecution. It's unavoidable. It's inescapable. It's unalterable. And some of us has figured it out. So we start off talking about Jesus. Then we realize that people don't like that so much. And then we decrease talking about Jesus. How many times have you seen some athlete try to come on the scene determined to talk about Jesus only to realize that it affects their bottom line, their profit, and then they go to just kind of pointing up in the air or, you know, hiding something maybe on some under, like, oh, my tag, if you get my jersey, if you go under the second flap and you turn over and you pull it inside out and you read it backwards and I give you a code on my website and you can decipher what it says. It says, Jesus is Lord. 
That's because we know people don't like it when Jesus is in your face in front. But they were talking about Jesus to the point where the people in charge are annoyed with them and they arrest them. I went to Virginia preaching. I ran away from my father because he was a Christian. And I began to go and I told people about Jesus. And part of that meant I told them that we should not do drugs. And they laughed at me. I told them that we should not be sleeping around until it's our wife or our husband. And they laughed at me. And I went from the cool kid from New York to this, this cornball who's telling us that we shouldn't do all the things that we want to do. And they laughed so much that I stopped talking about Jesus for five years. I didn't talk about four years. I didn't start talking about Jesus again till four years later when a secular rapper started talking about Jesus incorrectly. <laughs> I was like, oh, snap. You could talk about Jesus, but he's talking about him wrong. Dad, I wish I would have known that. I would have been talking about Jesus. If you're committed to faithful Jesus in it, cross in it, Jesus talk, you will experience pushback. Jesus told us this in John 15. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. When you go to school, when you go to your job, when you go out on the corner. Until now, the church has had no pushback. Pentecost, Peter gets up and lightning strikes. The spirit comes. 3,000 saved. An outbreak of faith. That's 3,000. Now, we keep moving. It says that they were on a high. Got to the point where people who had double houses started bringing their houses and saying, you can have a house. <laughs> you get a car. You get a car. You get a car. <laughs> Just kidding. By the outworking of the Spirit, now we hear 5,000. In other words, the church is on a high. Sometimes you preach Christ and you go platinum. <laughs> Most times you preach Christ and they pull you off the shelf or put you at night when no one's listening or re relegate you to the sidelines. We're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. But as the church is successful, guess who comes in? The Sadducees. So it says here, the Sadducees, verse 2, greatly annoyed because they were teaching people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, they arrested them. And you notice that the apostles have social impact, but they also seem to have religious impact. And that's what the church should do. The church should impact the realm of the social and the church should impact the realm of the religious. The Sadducees were a religious and a political group. In the days of Jesus, the Pharisees, if you read your gospel, the Pharisees are the ones that are always in the picture arguing with Jesus. Pharisees and experts in the law. During the crucifixion, you keep hearing less about the Pharisees and more about the Sadducees. You know why? Because the Sadducees were the, the, the ruling class. They were the people who had a religious image, but primarily a political focus. They were the ones who said, don't you know, it is better for you if one man would die than for the nation to die. They were the ones in the room making up what we call the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were made up of primarily Sadducees, wealthy people who had the religious power. They brokered deals with Rome so that the Jews had a, a peace. They could do Jewish things under Roman rule. So the Sadducees are not just theological. In fact, they, did, they, they only accepted teachings from the Pentateuch and not the rest of the Old Testament. They rejected key doctrines like resurrection, angels, and the afterlife. For them, this life is where you got to get it. You get it now and you keep it and you don't let anyone else take it from you, which is why they're annoyed with Jesus in his life because they thought he's taking the power and the attention. And now they're annoyed at those who keep Jesus's mission alive. They come and they say, what, 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 what? Arrest them. We'll deal with them in the morning. Well, the gospel was not bound, even though the apostles were. They arrested them, but many who heard believed. I like this. We could just pause here and do a little missions uh, moment. In one sense, the apostles are in step with broader culture, the broader cultural landscape. They went to the temple like a good Jew would go to the temple. 
They went at the time everyone else goes, the time of prayer. <laughs> they had solidarity with the Jews, even though they themselves were developing Christians. They were not adversarial in spirit. They would call you together and say, brothers, listen, they didn't come with combative terms. They came with the term of endearment. Brothers, let us tell you this Jesus whom you killed. So they did not hide truth and they also did not hide indictments, but they presented that truth. And even when they made those indictments, they did it having laid the groundwork within authentic brothers. We're just talking about somebody who's in step with the cultural landscape, but at the same time, they're different. They're not marked by boldness, even though they're marked by boldness, they're also marked by humility, solidarity, but they keep their distinction. And so that's how we ought to go out there and take the gospel. But you're going to get pushback no matter how cute you are, no matter how well you do it. No matter what kind of groundwork you sort of lay out, eventually you're going to hit a brick. I like the story of John Wesley who said that John Wesley was preaching all over the place and it had been so long since he had got persecuted that he said, man, I just, I just like, it feels like nothing has happened to me. And he prayed, he asked the Lord, have I backslidden? Because I haven't been persecuted in, like, in, in a while. Well, as he said that, he stooped down to tie a shoe and a brick just missed his head. <laughs> and he looked up and he said, Lord, thank you for affirming that I'm still yours. <laughs> now, it sounds like legend and I don't know if it's true, but, you know, some of these illustrations still give you the point. No matter how much you wise up, the pressure will be on you to turn down. We're in a day where people don't want Christ like they used to want Christ because they know the world and the culture doesn't want Christ like it used to want Christ. The church must preach Christ despite pressure. We also do good works for Christ and we do it by his power. In other words, the church's faithful witness is comprised of an announcement of good news and good deeds to show off the good God. Look what it says. Verse 5 to 10. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? In other words, there it is again. Who's your authority? Who's your power? We're the power, not you. But you're moving in power. You're acting like you have power. Where is the power? The Sanhedrin also galvanized by power and they have a common enemy. So they're galvanized by purpose. You see the Pharisees and the Sadducees actually hated each other. But at this point, they're unified together. So this Sanhedrin asked him, Hold on, what's the power? What's the authority? Why do you do what you do? Now, before Peter answers to show them what power, and before Peter answers about what authority, we need to know that there are those who are more tribal than they are biblical. You see these lists of characters? Annas is called the high priest. But he wasn't the high priest. He was deposed by Rome. Rome got him up out of there. But Caiaphas is there and he is the high priest and they were in the same family. And so what we believe is that Annas and Caiaphas, though Caiaphas was the high priest, Annas is called the high priest because he still had power and influence even though he was out of office. Yikes. Oh, I'm sorry. So first was win, 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 win. And now, power and influence, even though you're out of office. Okay, context is everything. <laughs> so this is, so they're not spiritual. You know, the Sanhedrin had 70 members plus one, the high priest. You know what the 70 is from? 70 elders in Israel. In other words, they were trying to, like, give off a spiritual background and heritage for their identity. But as you can see, they're always finding somebody to kill and arrest and persecute. In other words, they're not spiritual. 
but they are political. They're not spiritual, but they are tribal. And here they've unified, even though they're ideologically divided, theologically divided with the Pharisees, but they're unified on this. We don't like Jesus. You know that the world is full of division, but there's one thing that the world is unified on. We don't like Jesus much. And we don't like people who seem to like Jesus as much. We don't mind people who talk about Jesus some. We just don't like people who give their lives to Jesus and live for Jesus and continue to make Jesus the main attraction. The world is united. When I was rapping, I remember when Kanye West said, they say I can rap about anything except for Jesus. And he did a song called Jesus Walks. His greatest song to this date. It's not about Jesus, the real Jesus walking right, because I think Jesus walks, which he did before he was saved, was Jesus walking behind Kanye. Many years later, he put out another album called Jesus is King, and I think he displayed that, oh, Jesus is not walking behind me, I'm walking after him. Now, I don't know if it's true. He released a new album, so I, I'm not here to defend Kanye. I'm just here to say, Kanye even told us, you can rap about anything, just not Jesus. When I was younger, there was a guy named Chuck D of a group called Public Enemy. <laughs> Farrakhan's a prophet that I think you ought to listen to. I said, wow, we can recommend preachers? <laughs> yeah, not Christian ones, <laughs> but Farrakhan's the prophet that I think you ought to listen to. Didn't you hear me? There was another guy by the name of Rakim. They call him the God MC because he's so nice with it. And he came out and say, all oh, praise be to Allah. And that's a blessing. So one day I got up on the mic. I said, praise to Jesus Christ. And a friend of mine grabbed the mic and said, all oh, praise to Allah. And the crowd looked at me like I was crazy and looked at him like he said something praiseworthy. In other words, <laughs> this is why we, we did a, this is sidebar. I'm getting, I'm feeling comfortable with you, family. <laughs> This is why when I became a rapper, I decided I'm just going to be poor. And I said, hey, let's do our own label. It was an independent label. And I was like the widow with Zarephath. I was like, I'm just going to drop this album and die. <laughs> I'm going to just drop this album and just go off and, and ask Pico Energy, can I work for them? <laughs> this group is unified. They're galvanized by power. They're unified in purpose. And the purpose is let's blunt and stop salvation from going on. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. There's the power. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said, rulers of the people and elders. Look at that. Not name calling. Titles, respectful titles. My brother Joshua, uh, who's out there today, told us, hey, he's part of a group that goes and prays with people on both sides of the aisle. And they're always amazed when they come in without jabs, but they come in with respect and prayer requests. Look at Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it means that the character of Christ is in you. And Christ was the type to do good to people who didn't deserve it. Speak well to people who would get on your nerves. Fill with this power. And every time the Bible talks and acts about the power of the Holy Spirit, it's like someone who has something in them that's outside of them that allows them to do something they would never be able to do. Testosterone matters. H-G-A. PEDs. These are athletes recognition that what I have on my own is not sufficient. Give me something on the inside of me so I can perform better for all the people who are outside of me. Take it away. They always think it's them too, don't they? Well, it wasn't that really wasn't though. It wasn't that. It's just I have an eye for seeing the ball and I got a good technique. They say, right. But when you weren't on the stuff, <laughs> those home runs went to ground out doubles. Peter goes on, filled with the power source. If we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Notice what Peter, 
Peter says. He says, are we being interrogated about doing a good deed? He says, wait, we're being examined concerning a good deed? This is the Lord Jesus' problem with people. He say, wait a minute, it's the Sabbath and you're mad because I'm making a daughter of Abraham whole on the Sabbath? I'm doing good on the day when you rest from all of the peripheral work, but you're alive to the good works. He says, God is faithful, though he rested from work. On the Sabbath, he still kept oxygen, right? On the Sabbath, he still keeps the sun out. They said, we do good like Jesus did good. In other words, faithful witness here was good news gospel that also shows up in the form of good deeds gospel. The church announces good news. And so people won't say blah, 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 blah. It's just words. We enact good deeds because we're like the good God. Look what Acts 10, 38 says when Peter went to a man by the name of Cornelius' house. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. You're like your God when your news is good, gospel, and your deeds are good, gospel. <laughs> And I'm not calling good deeds the gospel. What I'm saying is, in the words of Dr. Robert Smith, if you didn't see him, let me just give you a snapshot of one of his pithy sayings. He says, we don't socialize the gospel, but we do gospelize the social. Yeah. In other words, our good deeds are to bring attention and to bolster the fact that we do have good news. Yeah. Yeah. That should be our reputation, doing good. He preached the good news because that's how good God is. So in the text, they have a good deed. The man got it. It didn't matter that they didn't know him. They didn't know his views. They didn't know if he was part of their tribe. All they knew was he was in need, and so they did. This is what the church does. We do this by what? The power of God. Just like it says the power of the Spirit led Jesus to go about and do good, just like Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, which is his power, bears witness to the fact we just did good by the same Holy Spirit power. We do good deeds with Christ's power. This is what we're doing. The way you keep going and giving away salvation, a good salvation, is to do it committed to good news, the gospel, and good deeds, verification that your gospel is more than words. Yeah. Lastly, we have to bear witness to Christ in and despite the culture. You bear witness. Now, this is what I mean by bear witness. To bear witness is to make sure that no one confuses your good deeds for just good deeds, but good deeds being God deeds. Look what it says. This man has been healed. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by him this man is standing before you well. In other words, we don't want to just go and help people to learn to read and say sayonara. We don't want to just go build the well and say, love ya. <laughs> you see them taking an opportunity. We're talking about if you're giving salvation away. We're talking about if you got salvation and you're giving salvation away, you'll build the well. But you'll find a way to let them know. But it's by Jesus Christ of Nazareth's power and goodwill toward you that you're getting me who didn't know you to come here on my own dime and some friends of mine who also believe in this Jesus and this good God and give you this good well and give you this education and give you this disaster relief and give you this, give you this, give you this. And we don't do one without the other. We don't go and give people disaster relief, but everything else about the way we relate to them is uh, in a way that's contrary to the good spirit of the gospel. One time I got into a little debate with a guy because I did feel like there was a time when the disaster that hit Puerto Rico not long ago had mixed reviews. There was a lot of talk as though they were lesser but then they boast that, but we went and we helped them. I said, okay, amen. Praise God for the help. Just allow your words 
to not contradict your deeds. It says that this man has been healed. Interestingly enough, this word healed in the Greek, it's sozo. Sozo is the word translated salvation normally. Sozo is the word that's translated salvation. So salvation in the Bible can be healing or tangible, physical, earthly restoration. But it also can and usually is talking about a spiritual salvation or a spiritual rescue. Look what D.A. Carson, the New Testament scholar, notes, and I agree. The entire created order is under God's curse because of human sin. Sin is not first and foremost horizontal, social, though of course it is all of that. It is vertical, the defiance of almighty God. The sin which most consistently is set to bring down God's wrath on the heads of his people or on entire nations is idolatry. What's that? The de-godding of God. It is this overcoming, excuse me, it is the overcoming of this most fundamental sin that the cross and resurrection of Jesus achieve. I sent that. Y'all don't have that one? It just was a lot. I was trying to see that up on the screen real quick. It's not there? Amen. Praise God. But I like the way D.A. Carson gets an amen from a man who precedes him, a man by the name of J. D. Otis Roberts, who said something very similar many years ago before. He says this, sin is a broken vertical relationship before it is a broken horizontal relationship. There is estrangement between God and humanity. And this explains why each person is set against his or her brother and sister. The fall comes before the first murder. Sin is the desire to be, quote, as gods. It is self-glory. Sin is misusing the freedom, which is God-given, to say no to the one who makes it possible to say anything. He's a contemporary and even a somewhat scholarly combatant of James Cone. Why did they not want this salvation, either for themselves or for this man or for Israel? Psalm 118, look at Acts 4, 11 and 12. I know the answer to this. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. He basically quotes from Psalm 118, which is about the builders, the leaders, people with the power, people with the influence, people who have their own agenda intact. And then Jesus comes along and he disrupts it by announcing that he is king, that he is Lord, that his agenda should triumph, that his salvation should go throughout all the earth and that he should be the king that everyone pledges to. And so the builders reject the very cornerstone, the best stone that the whole building is supposed to be aligned with in other words the world doesn't realize that in their dislike or this disdain or their distance from the Lord Jesus that their dislike and disdain and distance is from the very stone on which they must build their lives on Christ the solid rock we stand all other ground is what sinking sand <laughs> Oh, he said, anyone who hears my words bows the knee as though it were. He said, his, he's like the person who, or she's like the person who builds their house on a solid foundation, solid rock. When the winds come, when life gets crazy, when the pandemic swoops through, when it stays longer than you thought, when unemployment blindsides you, when cancer creeps in, whoa, when that doctor's report goes south, uh, when your career and your athletic ability sort of diminishes, when the, when the business goes bankrupt, when things, the winds come house stands he said but the people who reject this stone the stone becomes the rock that crushes them one time I ran into a stone that was meant to keep me from going off a cliff I said well it both saved me and it crushed my car (laughs) I know both of these things let's end this verse 12 This Jesus is the stone 
Verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation is sourced exclusively, offered universally, and must be applied personally. Salvation is sourced exclusively, offered universally, (laughs) applied personally. (laughs) He says here something that makes people mad. There's only one way. In one name. In that one way, in one name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say Yahweh, praise God for Yahweh. Yahweh gave Jesus the name above every name, that that's the name that people would bow. That at the name of Jesus, everyone would bow. He says, Jesus is the one, and there's salvation in no one else. <laughs> he says, I'm the one way. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, enter into the narrow gate. He says, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many find it. Narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. Few find it. Have you taken the one way? One day we saw some scholars, supposedly Christians, on a stage debating, is Jesus the only way? And one guy who everybody seems to like as a Christian, I don't get it because he said, I can't say Jesus is the only way. He said, well, the way I grew up, I mean, he's the only way for me, but I can't say he's the only way. He said, because I haven't tried all the paths. Well, let the Bible and let Jesus speak for those who haven't tried all the paths because the Lord Jesus says, I made all the paths and I booby trapped it so that there's only one way. It's called a street called Jesus. There's one way, and in a pluralistic society with over 4,000 recognized religions, we say that's arrogant, that's preposterous. I'm just telling you King's Cross, and I'm out of here. I'm about to step down, put on my Sixers hat, and I'm going to shake hands, drink coffee, eat some M&Ms upstairs, and I'm bouncing. So don't hurt me. There's only one way. Hear Yahweh. Say it, Isaiah 43, 11, I am the Lord and besides me there is no Savior. Uses the same language, which is why when Jesus came, he says, I'm the one that has the forerunner. The forerunner prepares the way for Yahweh. Jesus showed up and says, I'm the one that you've been waiting for. Jesus and Yahweh are the same, but he uses the Jesus name because guess what Jesus' name means? The Lord saves. This is about salvation this morning. Hosea 13, 4, but I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me. Besides me, there is no Savior. There it is again. That same word, there's only one Savior. And God is not afraid to tell you, I rigged it so there's only one Savior. They say there's two kinds of religion. I like this. Got it from MacArthur. So shout out to MacArthur. I have some issues, but I like this. Two religions, the religion of human achievement and the religion of divine accomplishment. There's you finding a way and there's you submitting to the way. There's the way that he accomplished and there's the way you try to come up with. Human achievement can't get you there. But divine accomplishment has already made the way. Let me conclude Luke 24, 47, at the end of the life or the earthly ministry, the resurrected Jesus is talking to his disciples and it says, he said to them, I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus, this is then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. This right here was Jesus saying, this is what's got to happen now. That you have to go to the four corners and you have to tell people that forgiveness and repentance is available, but it's through one name. This is what we are to go out and do. This is salvation on the move. And so what he does is he says, so this is what Genesis to Revelation will be about. It will be about God coming and creating a scenario where there would need to be salvation. (laughs) 
You know, in Genesis 1 and 2, there's no need for redemption because everything, worship is like it should be. Everything is good, 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 good. Got to man, very good. It's not until Genesis 3 that we realize that we're going to need salvation. Salvation means rescue, deliverance. Deliverance from what? First from God. Remember? The vertical beef. And then deliverance from each other because I made you mad. I got to watch my back. You made me mad. You got to watch your back. The one who delivers from vertical and horizontal beef. The one who delivers from vertical and horizontal trouble, struggle, strife, and ultimately condemnation came through Moses all the way to the time where we see Peter and John talking to them all the way to today. Oh, he stopped. He says, you know, I went to Abraham, Abram, and I said, Abram, I'm going to use you and through you will come the one. He says, now he'll produce many, but through you will come the one. Joshua comes on the scene. He says, hey, I'm going to show you all that the one will ultimately rally us in a place. So Joshua gets to lead people into a land as a sneak preview of the fact that God is going to be with his people. Everybody who wants the one will rally around the one in his place. Oh, but Joshua, you know, he's not good enough. The Bible says that after him, you know, we get the judges and the judges come just to show you that. We'll just do it ourselves. We'll always want to be king. It says, man, the the judges, I mean, everybody, there was no king. And so everybody did what was right in their own eyes. They all wanted their own way. <laughs> oh, but there's a one coming. <laughs> but no one yet. Next, you know, God says, okay, you want a king? Let me give you one so you'll get used to the fact there should be one. But let me give you the one like you like, Saul. <laughs> Look good. <laughs> but Saul was no, he was no kind of king that you would want. He looked kingly, but he acted cruelly. I'm almost finished. I feel, okay, how about David? Oh, David's better, but even David is not good enough. How about Solomon? Come on, Solomon. Oh, no, Solomon had a good start, but a horrible finish. How about the prophets? No, they, they, they screamed a lot, <laughs> but they're not the one. How about the priests? No, they facilitate the sacrifices but I'm the sacrifice. Oh, you could keep going all the way down redemptive history. Then the Lord Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes. I'm going to end like this. I said I'm closing and this is really the closing. Psalm 146.3 says it like this, put no trust in princes and a son of man in whom there is no salvation. I almost preached on that passage, but I get the included here is my dismount. It says don't put your trust in exalted people. There is no salvation there. There's no salvation. Don't believe in a son of man. <laughs> oh, but guess what the text can say? But there is the son of man and then this son of man their salvation and then no other <laughs> if you got the great salvation today you must either give it up or give it away I say let's give it away it's just what you do let's pray